Okay, it's 11.03. Um, I'd like to welcome you to this first webinar on the Consumer Engagement Quality and Safety Marker. Um, I'll be opening with a karakia. Uh, whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, kia makina kina ki uta, kia ma taratara ki tai, e hi ake ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, ti he Māori ora. Um, as I said, uh, welcome to the first webinar on the Consumer Engagement Quality and Safety Marker. Um, you'll be hearing from four of us today, Chris Walsh, Richard Hamblin, myself and Ying Lee. Um, so we'll get started. But first of all, I just had a few housekeeping um, to, do with the, to do with asking a question. So how do you ask a question on this webinar? You submit your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. So hopefully you can all see it there at the bottom um, and you can see where the arrow is just indicating that there. Um, please note that the chat function has been disabled. And it would also be helpful if you have a question for a specific speaker, if you could include the name of the panel member with your question. Um, of course, like all webinars, this is gonna go very quickly. So we apologize in advance if you don't get to ask your question or we don't get to answer it rather live, but we'll also be compiling um, all submitted questions um, and we'll email these out after the conclusion of this webinar. Um, this will also be recorded um, and we will also be having a subsequent follow-up webinar as well. So without further ado, I will pass over to the first speaker on this session. Um, and that is Dr. Chris Walsh. Um, Chris is the Director of Partners in Care, and Partners in Care is the Health Quality and Safety Commission's Consumer Engagement Program. Thank you. Uh, kia ora everyone, I'll just extend uh, my welcome to uh, everybody who's tuned in for this uh, webinar uh, on um, the quality and safety marker for consumer engagement. So. Today, um, at this moment in time, I'm going to be covering the background for um, the development of the quality and safety marker. So the kind of why, the how, and the when. Um, and I think probably one of the first things I need to say is that we started looking at um, a quality and safety marker in sort of general terms about um, about five years ago here at the Commission. And so um, we've just, at that time, we're, we're exploring ideas, looking at the evidence um, internationally, looking at um, what's been done around New Zealand and trying to think about um, consumer engagement and how we might try and understand how it contributes to, to quality in the health services. So the motivation for it was, was really about, um, you know, understanding what effective consumer engagement looks like um, and how services and consumers might know um, that the engagement that was going on was, was actually effective and, and influencing the health outcomes. Um, so at, at that time we were, we were kind of developing our own resources um, in the commission and one of the themes that ran through all those resources was really about um, the importance of consumer engagement, not only at direct care level, but also at um, uh, policy level, um, service delivery and governance. So that's just a kind of little bit of background. 2015 might seem like a long time ago, and indeed for some of us here, it does feel like a long time ago that we've sort of been tinkering around the edges with this, but we've certainly gained some momentum in the last couple of years and I'll share with you uh, some of the kind of, um, I guess, the signposts along the way. So let's look at the why. Why, um, why have we developed this quality and safety marker? So as I said uh, just a couple of minutes ago, we, we, we were looking for evidence around patient experience, um, consumer engagement, and we were trying to um, see what was around uh, in terms of looking at how do we know consumer engagement is working. And so we started to find some stuff, um, especially internationally. Uh, uh, you know, we, we found a randomized controlled trial actually that, uh, that looked at um, evidence that patient experience and clinical effectiveness um, are all kind of um, linked. And so at that time, finding a randomized controlled trial, as you can imagine, 
um, was quite significant because much of the work and much of the evidence around consumer engagement was not at that level of kind of evidence. So um, we started kind of tinkering around quite a bit more um, and we found um, that the Australian Commission had, I think in 2014, put together a, um, uh, an, an audit tool and one of the, the um, auditing signals was uh, looking at consumer engagement. And so we had a look at that and we were quite interested in that. And the feedback from the auditing over in Australia was quite interesting and I guess at that time not so unexpected. Uh, and the feedback from the services over in Australia who were being audited really rated the sort of consumer engagement quite low um, and really didn't understand uh, how to engage with consumers. And this came through um, in the auditing that they were doing around the place. So, um, you know, other places have really kind of looked at um, patient reported outcomes, patient experience surveys, and, and quite a lot at that sort of direct care level, but not a lot um, looking at that sort of, you know, um, consumers having an influence over service delivery and over policy and over governance. So, um, Engaging with consumers, family, whānau remains a priority in health and disability services. Well, this has become more and more important. And I think when we were um, starting our work uh, in consumer engagement, uh, one of the first things that we did was a guide for DHBs around consumer engagement, which was really looking at a lot of the evidence. And so if you, if you go to that um, guide, you'll see um, a lot of international evidence around consumer engagement and I'll, it's on the next slide, you'll, you'll see a whole kind of slide of some of the resources that we've got out. But the next kind of iteration of this um, kind of guide that we looked at, we put in uh, last year, uh, was in primary care and so it was a different kind of, kind of guide and it was different because we had um, much more awareness and recognition of New Zealand as a society, New Zealand as a place, um, you know, to, to receive hospital care and to receive care in primary care. So, so we looked at um, much more around diverse communities uh, and te tiriti a waitangi. So the Crown's obligations under the treaty has come out a lot more in the health services um, in New Zealand in the last few years, particularly with the poor outcomes for, for Māori. So this um, guide in primary care is, is, um, is, is much different than the first one that we did um, and, and much more located in our kind of New Zealand society. And so, so the diverse communities, I mean, if you think about that as a term, where does that even come from? And we thought to ourselves, oh, is that the right term um, to use? And, and I guess that uh, you know, brings really a point about the whole kind of way in which we've, we've developed this um, consumer engagement quality and safety marker with, with partners, partners and with people in the sector is the language that's used. It's a, it's a whole different ball game. And, and with that sort of term, diverse communities, we thought, are people going to be happy with that? What do we do? Are Māori going to be happy with a term like that? And so we sought initially advice from um, Māori in um, the contacts that we have uh, through the Commission here and talked about it and discussed it. And they were actually okay with it. Um, it may well be that other Māori are not happy with a term like that. Um, and within those diverse communities, of course, we've in the primary care guide looked at Pacific communities and uh, the rainbow community and um, people with disabilities. So, um, you know, it's, it's a real kind of um, interesting conundrum when you come to using language um, with work that we've been doing. And I think the bottom line for us really is, um, you know, even the term consumer, um, the term engagement, it's really about um, what suits the communities, what communities identify with and what they feel comfortable with. <coughs> so, um, as I said, we've had no quality and safety marker for consumer engagement locally or in other jurisdictions. And I think Richard will touch on this um, in um, the presentation that he gives next. Um, 
And I think I remember from the slide that he said, we really tried, we really, really, really tried. And that coming from Richard means that we really did try. Um, answering the question, what does successful consumer engagement look like and how does it improve the quality and safety of services? This is what this quality and safety marker is actually about. Um, it's not an audit tool, it's something to help services uh, improve the services that they deliver and work in partnership with consumers. So that's kind of a little bit of the why. Um, so that's kind of like the soft why around it. This might be a little bit of the hard why around it, which is the minister's letter of expectations for 2021. So um, the minister at that time um, acknowledged um, service user council. So here's another term. Um, we're not using consumer, we're using service user councils, but I think we kind of mostly know what that means. Service user and consumer councils are key mechanisms through which service users can give feedback on how health and disability services are delivered in different communities. The Health Quality and Safety Commission has provided guidance to support an effective approach. So here we have the guide uh, for district health boards and the progressing consumer engagement in primary care, which I've just talked about. Um, he says, goes on to say, I'm aware that many DHBs already have strong user service councils and I want to strengthen this across all districts and regions and the commission in partnership with the sector has developed quality and safety markers for service user engagement and I encourage your DHB to participate in that. So this is kind of like you know something um, I guess coming from from the minister and kind of helps support um, the work that the sector has been doing around consumer engagement and acknowledging it. So I just want to go on a little bit um, and look at how, how we've gone about um, developing this quality and safety marker. So we've um, had the approach agreed by the Commission's executive leadership team um, and by the board. So uh, I think this happened in 2000 and, oh, what are we doing? Uh, 2018, I think we had that kind of agreement. Um, and even though we started the work in 2015, there was a lot of um, kind of, as I said, tinkering around the edges and looking at the evidence and sussing things out. Um, trying to figure out if this was something that we wanted to do, um, talking with consumers, talking with providers, um, and just sort of gathering more and more information. So by, by the time it kind of went to the board and it went to the um, leadership team here at the commission, um, we had quite a lot of information. So of course, when you're doing anything like this, you've got to sort of establish a reference group and um, it didn't take us long to get a reference group um, together. Uh, but what was important in this for us was looking at the makeup of the reference group. And so we wanted to have um, key people um, and it was important for some reason to have an equal number of consumers and an equal number of providers. Uh, so we did that, um, we got sort of equal numbers of consumers and providers and we wanted a kind of at what you might call a representative lens over it as well. So we wanted Māori and Pacific there and we wanted uh, people with disability um, and we wanted providers from across the sector as well. So um, we did that and we also had a person from the Ministry of Health sitting on there and an international expert as well. Um, who knows a lot about um, co-design. So, so that was kind of like the makeup of the group plus some of the staff here at the, at the commission. Um, four pilot sites agreed to um, undertake the work in looking at the development of this quality and safety marker. And so those four pilot sites have provided wonderful material, um, you know, that, that all the other DHBs and all the other services that will be um, developing their own quality and safety marker along these lines will be able to use some really wonderful resources. So uh, the pilot sites that, that agreed um, to be involved were um, Counties Manukau or DHB, Waitamata, um, Waikato and Canterbury. So those four services have really provided um, you know, a lot of input into this quality and safety marker. There was a, um, discussions with consumer councils and DHB, so we went around and we had some community meetings. I know some of the pilot sites had community meetings as well, um, getting input um, from all kinds of levels really. 
Uh, and at the reference group, we developed a, a support framework. This took a period of time, and Dion will be going through the um, support framework uh, when he does um, his presentation, and you, you'll be able to watch the unfolding of the SURE framework, which is S-U-R-E and stands for supporting, understanding, responding and evaluating. So when someone says we do consumer engagement in our service, we can say, are you sure? Um, so sometimes those little things are quite kind of interesting and provide a little bit of a hook in. Um, so the piloting was actually undertaken once people had um, got a whole lot of kind of tools together. Um, we've been keeping people updated, the CEs and the quality and risk managers. Um, so we did our last presentation to the quality and risk managers in February um, this year, and there's another one coming up in a couple of weeks to keep them updated as well. So the rollout is planned for 2020-21, which is now, and as you can see, is supported by the letter of expectation. And it's also um, incorporated into the annual DHB planning. So I've just got this um, slide here, which is just some of the resources um, that have helped us in the thinking about consumer engagement and how to kind of develop it. And there's a couple here um, that I've already mentioned. You can see on the, on the top right, um, progressing consumer engagement in primary care. Um, which came out last year and in 2015, engaging with consumers. And if you look at both of those, they're quite sort of different in their approaches, which really, you know, in some way, it kind of reflects the quality and safety marker. It's not something that is set in concrete. Um, it's something that's flexible and should be, um, you know, responsive to communities. Uh, one of the big things that underpins some of the work that we've we've been doing is the whole approach around co-design. And so, um, you know, the expectation in this quality and safety marker would be that um, services would have some indication and would be able to, to demonstrate that they are using co-design in their service. Um, the other thing, of course, is um, um, we've got some stuff around our consumer network, but the DHB consumer councils are really important in the development of this as well. Um, so all the DHBs um, should have consumer councils or something similar already set up and I think most of them are, are kind of there on that. So um, if we just go to this um, final kind of slide here, this is the sort of when. And so in the DHB plans you can see here um, improving consumer engagement, DHBs are expected to participate in the quality and safety marker for a consumer engagement by uh, setting up a governance group or an oversight group of staff and consumers to guide implementation of the marker, to upload data onto the consumer engagement QSM dashboard using the SURE framework as a guide and report against the framework at least annually um, by quarter three. So Dion and Ying will be going um, through that a little bit in a little bit more detail later on in, in this um, this presentation, but I just wanted to finish um, making a few comments about the governance group. Um, we have had some, some feedback um, from some of the services that um, there is a little bit of reticence around setting up a governance group and that the go-to group um, for something like this is something like the Consumer Council. Um, I think that's one way to do it, but um, you know, this is an important piece of work and it's something that um, we can all own. Uh, and in, in setting up a governance group, it's important to have the consumers and the providers working in partnership. Um, we have put some terms of reference, or just a draft guide for terms of reference for a governance group um, on the dashboard. So there's a whole lot of information on the dashboard as well. But this governance group is important because there is some work to do. We need to um, move away from that kind of ad hoc sort of, you know, just have a look at this and see what you think of this kind of process that we sometimes do. We need something that's um, it's much more kind of supported and to build a kind of team within that governance group who can look at what needs to be done, who can provide some advice. Um, it may well um, have a person from the Consumer Council. It's probably a good idea, but just divvying it over to the Consumer Council um, to do and just 
get them to feed back on things isn't, isn't really kind of taking the notion of partnership um, to its full kind of level. And from what I understand, a lot of the consumer councils have got a lot of work to do um, anyway. Uh, so having this kind of group set up with good representation from the communities for Māori and Pacific and for other groups um, in the community as well as for providers will be a good way of really um, getting this kind of quality and safety marker up and running. It's a time limited group, it would be a time limited sort of group so it wouldn't run forever but um, you know it would be something that would be exciting to be involved in and um, hopefully uh, services will see the value of this rather than just divvying it over to the consumer council on an ad hoc sort of basis. Uh, so I think that's all I have at the moment. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you for listening and hopefully you've got some um, questions that we can, as a panel, discuss at the end. Okay, thank you um, myself. I can thank myself for that. Um, we'll move on to our second presentation. And uh, this one is Richard Hamlin. Richard is the Director for Health Quality Intelligence here at the Commission. And his presentation will look at how measurement and quality improvement fit together. So welcome, Richard. Uh, well, hello everyone. I'm uh, Richard Hamlin. I'm Director of Health Quality Intelligence at the Commission. I'm delighted to be here today to talk a little bit about this concept of how measurement and quality improvement uh, fit together, how they interact. Um, and with a, I'll talk about that for a few minutes and that will, I hope, tee up uh, some of my colleagues to talk a little bit more about uh, the SURE framework and how this works uh, overall uh, to deliver a consumer quality and safety marker. I think uh, when we talk about measurement and improvement, probably the first thing to say is that measurement isn't on an in and of itself uh, improvement. Uh, you'll have all uh, recognized the uh, old saying that you don't uh, fatten a pig by weighing it. Uh, so I reverse that on this uh, chap here. Uh, you know, working very hard in weighing himself uh, is not making a great deal of difference to his uh, his uh, perceived goal of uh, uh, weight loss. Um, and I think that's an important point to make. And it's sometimes actually used to uh, downplay the importance of measurement. Um, and I think it's measurement actually still does have a role in improvement, even though it isn't in and of itself. Uh, improvement. And I think it matters for, for two reasons. Um, the first is quote that we can only be sure to improve that which we can actually measure. If we are doing things but we don't know if it's having an effect, uh, then actually we uh, need to uh, reconsider uh, and make sure that it does uh, actually lead to the improvements we expect to see. The second element is, is uh, the fun quote on this slide. Um, and I suppose it's probably a 20 year uh, literature now, actually looking about how making information about the quality of health services, um, how about making that transparent, actually stimulates uh, improvement inside uh, health services. And uh, this has been reasonably well attested to. There's some debate about why this occurs uh, and this uh, rather complex model uh, has been as suggested as, as two potential um, pathways by which this works. The first is that uh, consumers make choices about where they go to uh, in uh, re receiving uh, healthcare uh, or accessing healthcare or, or, or co producing health. Um, the alternative is the very fact of making uh, information about quality available stimulates organisations to work better to Im improve their services. Um, to some extent it probably doesn't matter which of the two is actually correct for our purposes, simply to say by one of these mechanisms, or possibly both, um, we do see a relationship between making information available and uh, seeing uh, improvements uh, resulting. And that has uh, underpinned the way that the Commission has uh, considered um, how it uses information. Um, we've 
pretty much published every measure that, we, that uh, we've used and made publicly available, uh, particularly inside the quality uh, and safety markers of which this is um, a distinct uh, but um, latest uh, variant of. I think we really come down to the, the issue of what the quality and safety markers are about is, is trying to measure things that are, are unmeasurable. So if I was to talk about uh, consumer engagement, there isn't a, a unit of um, a consumer engagement, a, a consumer tron or something, and I can just look at uh, what's going on and say, you've got 37 of those, well done. That's not how it works. Uh, very often we're looking at quite uh, complex ideas that aren't directly measurable. Uh, quality being a really good good example of this. What exactly is quality and how do you measure it? Well, fortunately, um, somebody's been thinking about this really for the, about the last 60 years or first thought about it 60 years ago. And there was this rather distinguished looking chap called Avardis Dolabedian, who was a Lebanese pediatrician, actually. Um, but his great uh, insight was to recognize this kind of three elements that you want to understand in judging the quality of something. Uh, it's sometimes known as the Donabedian triad, but it's a combination of what you're up to. So if you first talked about structures, these are what you put inside your system. So it could be something like uh, the resources that you have, the relationships, the, um, the governance, the committees, the um, availability of training, all these sorts of um, aspects count as, as structure in the way that you thought of the world. Uh, process is what you actually do. So very often you're leveraging those assets that you have in order to do things. Uh, and that could be uh, ways that you communicate. It could be um, uh, opportunities to, um, uh, to be involved and give feedback. It's those sorts of um, sort of actual actions, things that really hit the road. Uh, and then finally, um, outcomes is what happens as a result. And these are you know, uh, about what happens to people as a result of their care. Um, how, does it, how does it help them? How does it not help? So it's important to actually get the, uh, the distinction between these right. So for example, using a specific electronic system is not a process, it's a structure. So you've got the, the, this electronic system there to help you, for example. Similarly, clinical actions, you know, the doctor did X or the nurse did Y is not an outcome, it's a process. And, and very often as people work their way through these, uh, it's getting the classification is actually the really critical thing to do. But process and outcome in particular have a close relationship. We would expect outcomes to flow from processes. And at the heart of the idea of the quality and safety marker, is, is this relationship that um, we would expect to see a, a way of, of behaving, a way of operating, and then we would expect to see uh, results, outcomes flowing from that. So I can show this in this little simple diagram here. So on the side, we've got processes, stuff that we do, outcomes, results along the top, uh, positive and negative. So what if people are doing the right things and they're getting the right results? Well, probably um, whatever you're doing looks to be working. But watch out for confounders because there may be some other things going on there and of course you know, no result is forever. If you're doing the right process but you're not getting the outcomes, well there's a, an idea called hitting the target and missing the point. It's, it's kind of uh, having the uh, right things written down or recording that you're doing things but not really doing them in the way that's anticipated. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's like doing your homework badly, I guess, in a sense. Um, could also be, of course, there's a new problem. Where actually, you're doing the thing that we anticipated, but something's changed and it's not having the, the, uh, the effect that we anticipated. If somebody's not doing the process and they're not getting the outcomes, it's quite useful to show that because what it does is removes the sort of excuse that we're different. Uh, so there's a kind of get on with it uh, sort of clarion call when you have those two uh, together. And then finally, perhaps most interestingly, what happens when you're not doing the process, but the outcomes improve? Well, it may well be there's something else going on, uh, maybe a bit of statistical uh, oddity, but typically actually there's something that we haven't considered. And actually it's doing that could also, or perhaps more importantly, uh, more, more firmly have the, uh, an effect on the outcome that we want. And the quality and safety markers, the way that they've worked, have deliberately brought together processes and outcomes so that we have this 
broader view of what's going on. In that way, they're quite distinct from sort of classical, uh, classical targets, really. However, the issue that we have is uh, in trying to measure what's going on in consumer engagement, that approach doesn't quite work. And we know that nobody's ever managed to develop a uh, Donabedian type uh, of measurement structure for consumer engagement. Uh, and believe me, we've looked very hard uh, to try and find that. So we actually had to sort of think from first principles about how we could use some of the data that are available to us and other data that can be collected to get to this broader view of what is happening in terms of consumer engagement in DHBs and how this is affecting quality of care. Um, and that really is uh, something that will up, uh, set up for my uh, colleagues to talk a little bit more about the Shaw framework. But I hope that's given a, a, a grounding in a bit of theory, if you like, about what we're trying to do here. Thanks very much for listening. Well, um, there we go. Um, kia ora everyone. Uh, it's uh, good to be with you here today. Um, it's my pleasure now to uh, move on to the next uh, part of the presentation, which is my colleague uh, Dion York, who is Programme Manager of Partners in Care. He's going to be talking a little bit more about the Shore framework and how you can contribute to it. So I'm happy to hand over uh, to Dion right now. Okay, so now I'll be telling you a little bit more about how to contribute to the quality and safety market for consumer engagement. You've already heard about um, some of the background uh, to the consumer engagement quality and safety market, and, and now you'll be wondering, well, how can I contribute to this and, and why should I contribute to this? Um, so first of all, what is the background and evidence behind the QSM? Um, why did we develop such a QSM? Um, who was involved with its development. So you've heard about those first two, three things. And so now I'm going to talk a little bit more about the first steps um, in taking part in the QSM. So as you would have seen, Chris talked a bit about um, setting up of the governance group or an oversight group of staff and consumers to guide implementation of the marker. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about uploading the data onto the consumer engagement quality and safety marker and a little bit about the SHORE framework, because you're probably wondering, well, what is the SHORE fr framework and how can I, can I contribute? So really what we're trying to answer is what does successful consumer engagement look like and how does it improve the quality and safety of services? Because over the years, um, as you know, there has been a lot of work to look at being more patient centered or adopting a co-design approach or working more in partnership. And we believe that all of these are positive steps um, in improving the quality and safety of the health system. But what we're interested to know now is what does it really look like when it's successfully done? And how do we actually know that we're making a difference? Um, and this consumer engagement quality and safety marker is the first step in trying to understand this and seeing how improvements can be made. So the contribution will be to the SHORE framework. So you'll be wondering, well, what is the SHORE framework and what does this stand for? Well, the SHORE framework is about is about four key areas. The first is supporting. So what is in place to support consumer engagement? The second is about understanding. So how do organizations make sense of what consumers are telling them? The third is around responding. So what has been done to respond to what consumers have said? And lastly, evaluating. What has been the impact of these evaluations? So that's the sure framework. So you can always ask yourself, if we're making improvements for the people who access our services, are we sure that we're doing this? This is a framework to think about when considering that question. There are some data already that the Commission holds about services that will contribute to the SHORE framework. These are primarily from the Adult Inpatient Experience Survey and the Primary Care Experience Survey. So in terms of the adult, and inpatient, the adult inpatient and primary care surveys, we can get under understanding what the response rate is for that. We can also look at the representativeness such as age, ethnicity and gender. So that's one part, piece of information that we already hold that will contribute to the SHORE framework. Then in terms of evaluating and looking at the impact of the intervention, um, we already have some relevant measures, again, from these two surveys. So we can track over time how our services are going and if improvements are being made. So that will form part of the SHORE framework. And that, as I say, is already routinely collected and we already hold such information. 
But if we go a little bit further and how the con you can make a contribution to, to the SHORE framework, we've developed a framework and as Chris and as Richard mentioned, um, over time with, with many, many stakeholders, um, and this is it in front of you. So what this shows um, on the left hand side are, are three categories. One is around engagement, one is around responsiveness, and one is around experience. And then for each of those domains, there are four possible ratings that you can give your service. You can either give minimal, you're in the consultation phase, you're in the involvement phase, or you're in the partnership and shared leadership phase. Now for each of these, because you'll be wondering about definitions, there is a detailed definition for engagement, a detailed definition for responsiveness, and a detailed definition for experience, which is available on the form page when you enter information into the quality and, for the quality and safety marker. And for each of these categories, whether it be minimal, consultation, involvement, or partnership and shared leadership, there is a detailed description for what each one looks like. So the question can be asked, if we think we are at, in the involvement stage for engagement, there are going to be five or six statements that tell you what that looks like or what you would need to do to categorize yourself as in the involvement stage. However, if you just did this as a tick box exercise and gave yourself a rating out of four, one for minimal, two for consultation, three for involvement, or four for partnership and shared leadership, then that really wouldn't be enough in and of itself. So there's also the opportunity for you to provide a commentary about why it is that you chose that particular rating for your service overall. And there's an opportunity to upload up to five examples in a range of formats to provide evidence as to why you gave a rating for your service in that way. So again, we have this framework will be available in a lot more detail um, and it's available on the QSM page um, of the Commission's website. So to give you one example um, in a bit more detail, if we look at experience, in the under experience, there are actually there are three statements for each of the ratings, but I've taken just one to show you as an example. So if you were minimal in the in experience when it comes to consumer engagement, then you would be reporting on experience metrics. So to be minimal, these metrics are reported on. That's fairly straightforward. To be in the consultation category, you would be looking a little bit further that not only are these metrics reported on, they're also shared with relevant stakeholder groups. To take that another step further, looking at involvement, not only would these metrics be reported on and shared with relevant stakeholder groups, you would also be involving consumers or your community in this work to be involvement. Under partnership and shared leadership, these metrics will be reported on, shared with relevant stakeholder groups, including the consumers involved with the work. The reporting would be timely and crucially to be partnership and shared leadership, the feedback loop would be closed. So, I mean, that's very important, obviously, that information is collected, um, that, that it's developed in such a way that it's relevant to everybody involved in that information but crucially that that information is used to make improvements. And so that's why that would be considered partnership and shared leadership. So if you want more information about how to fill in the consumer engagement quality and safety marker, um, Jung will be talking more about the practicalities of logging into the website and entering the information. But on top of that as well, we have developed a frequently asked questions on our page. We also have, um, the, the Consumer Engagement Quality and Safety Marker Reference Group, and many members of that would be happy to be contacted as they've piloted this work and they know the practical aspects of implementing it locally. And finally, you can always contact one of us here at the Commission and we'd be happy to help you. Great, so um, th thank you for listening to that. Um, and I will just keep moving on in the interest of time and pass over to Ying Li. Um, as I mentioned, um, Ying is going to be talking more about how you how you access the form and how you fill it out. Um, and Ying Li is a senior analyst at, in the health quality intelligence team here at the commission. So thank you, Ying. Now let's, now let's look at how to submit the data. Here is the screenshot of the homepage of HQSC website. Um, so the address is hqsc.govt.nz. Um, so on the top 
right corner you can see there is a button called out programs and then click the out programs uh, will bring up a list of all the program HQST is working on and in here you see H, uh, health quality intelligence and click this link you will be able to go to this page that is the projects of health quality intelligence at the bottom of the page you see a data submission platform click here then you get into this page of the data submission if you want to save all the clicks then you can just follow this link to go to this page directly on this page of several areas data uh, submitted one of them is a uh, consumer engagement click the old district health board then you will get to the login page use the email address and password we provided and then you can log in once you log in you see this page that's the first page of consumer engagement data submission um, on this page is mainly about your information so your name your organization phone number and email address um, and that is um, some links for the further information about this consumer engagement QSIM. Once you fill all the information, you just click next, then you go to the page two of the data submission. This page two is about engagement domain. Uh, for this domain, you first need to give a self rating, so from one, two, three, four. Choose one of as your self rating score and then upload your supporting documents. Um, so under this uh, up, uh, upload button, there is a box uh, for you to fill in a short description of that supporting document. Then another upload button in another box of and for another document. So the maximum number of documents you can upload is five for each domain. If you have more than five documents you want to send to us, then you can talk to us. We will see how you're going to submit other documents. So for page three is uh, responsiveness and for page four is the domain of experience. So once you finish all the four page data submission, you click submit button, then you will see this page pop up, tell you uh, your submission has been received. So that's the final page of the data submission. Once you see this, which means your submission is done. And once we received your data and the document, uh, we're going to do some background tidy up and reshape the data, reformatting those data and put it uh, uh, through a system and fit into the dashboard. So this is the uh, consumer engagement QSM dashboard. Uh, this is an interactive dashboard. So we use this dashboard to report um, the consumer engagement QSM. Here is the screenshot of the front page of the dashboard. You see there are four tiles uh, on the top, which lay out the framework of the consumer engagement QSM. And below that is a description about the framework. So the tiles are all clickable. So if you click one of them, you will be linked to that specific area. For example, if we click supporting, then here is the self rating page of the supporting um, area. Um, on the top are three filters. Uh, you can choose which DHB you want to look at. At the moment, for example, we choose Guatemala DHB. In the domain, we can choose from engagement and responsiveness and experience and also we can 
choose which reporting time period of the result we look at by moving the time bar. Uh, once you set up the three filters, then you set up the whole page uh, for the bar chart, for the box of uh, positioning statement, and also for the DHB stories. So all the contents will reflect to the filters you just set up. Now let's look at the bar chart first. This is a horizontal bar with different shade of green. In the light green is one, uh, which means a minimum, and the, the different shade of green means different uh, self-rating scores. So half over the mouse on one of the area, for example, the light green, you see this is engagement, and one means minimum, and 60% of 20 DHB gave themselves one for this time period for this engagement domain. Uh, if you move mouse to another shade of green, for example here, then you see this is two, uh, this means consultation, and 20% of 20 DHPs gave themselves um, as two for this engagement score. That's one um, information we want you to receive from this bar chart, which is the distribution of the scores. And the other information you can see is from the small uh, person icon. So this represents how the selected DHB uh, score themselves. For example, here is Vaitimata DHB. Uh, they score themselves for engagement as to consultation. Um, please note all this data behind this bar chart a mock-up data for this presentation. So this is the uh, horizontal chart. Um, then next we can see this is the DHB story box, which lists all the documents, uh, supporting documents DHB submitted to us. Uh, click one of the uh, cell, you will see the short description pop up for this supporting document, and there is a link below. So click this link, you will be able to go to the actual document to have a look. So the form of the document uh, can be different, like people can submit to us a um, PDF document, or Word document, or uh, videos, uh, and so on. Uh, so click the link, you can see the actual document. In the left hand side is the positioning statement. Uh, so above is uh, the self-assessment uh, result. Um, this presents the process of the consumer engagement QSM. We use the patient experience survey data to show the outcome of the uh, consumer engagement QSM. Uh, to make a good understanding of the survey result, we have this page, we call it understanding. On that page, first, you can choose which DHB to look at. For example, we look at Auckland DHB. Then this chart gave you the information about the response rate and response number. The line, black line is the response rate over time, how it's changed, and the bar chart is the response numbers uh, over time for the patient experience survey. And below that chart is two um, figures. One is the uh, representativeness by ethnicity, the other one is by age group. We use orange to uh, indicate there is uh, over representativeness and use gray to indicate this is under representative. So when we look at the bias ethnicity, we see Maori, 
Pacific and Asian, most of the bar is gray, so which indicated most of the um, survey period for those three ethnicity groups, they are under representative. But for uh, European and other, their orange color indicates they are over representative. If by age group, we look at this chart, uh, for younger age group and older age group, most of them are under representative. But for the middle age group, many of them are, are over representative. So this is the chart for the understanding uh, page of the uh, dashboard will help you to understand the representativeness of the patient experience result. At the moment, we only uh, show the adult inpatient experience results. In the future, we're going to include the primary care as well. So now is the evaluation page. In this page, uh, we show the outcome of the uh, consumer engagement QSM. Um, so first, to choose the domain to look at. We have four domains, communication, coordination, partnership, and special needs. So for example, we choose uh, communication, then we choose the time bar, and then we choose a DHB. So the result below will show the filters you just set up, and the map over here is to show the compare uh, comparison result for the select uh, for the select time period to compare with the first survey result for twenty DHBs. The light blue is uh, means this current selected survey round. The result actually is um, about the same as the first survey round. In the green is, means it is better than the first survey without. In the gray means this is uh, uh, no comparison because the low response. Uh, let's back to the bottom chart, which is show the four domain and the score over time. The black line is the score for each of the survey round and the pink line is the baseline median. We use the um, first four quarters median as a baseline median to compare with the uh, survey uh, result each round over time. So for this page, uh, you will see the outcome of the uh, consumer engagement uh, QSM. So that's all from this dashboard. So if you have a further question, uh, please just email us uh, while this uh, address, then we're happy to discuss further with you. Thank you. So um, thank you, Ying. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Dion. We do have um, a little bit of time left for questions. We have been responding to them throughout um, the webinar. And there's, I, I can't see any more um, questions on there, but notably there's a couple that we've had about the terms of reference uh, and people wanting a copy of those. And Dion, did you say you'd sent something around or? Terms, um, sorry, we have a terms of reference um, and we're happy to send that around and also add it to the frequently asked questions so that you can see it. It's just a template and feel free to use it however you want. Um, it, it's just, just to give you a bit of, of guidance. Um, and also too, um, there's, there's been some questions around, um, you know, how, how you rate services um, if you've got sort of four out of five categories, you've got it, but you don't have the sixth one. So, 
um, you know, the, the general rule that the, the QSM group has been um, adhering to is you'd probably rate yourself one back from that. Um, there's also been um, questions about how you collate everything around the DHB to then ultimately answer. So um, I put in the chat there that um, actually our reference group's been fantastic in developing um, templates they've been using locally to collate everything. So I'm sure that they'd be happy to share them and we can share them with all of you and also include them on the website. So you've got some examples of how to do that. Thank you, Dion. Um, yes, the, there are plenty, will be plenty of templates available. Uh, so I can't see any other questions there. The only other one that I can recall was about when this will become available and we will send you out the link um, when this webinar becomes available. Uh, so I'm sure that'll be pretty soon. Any further questions, qsm at hqsc.gov.nz. So before we finish, I'd just like to thank you all for um, participating in this webinar uh, and reminding you that hopefully within about four or five weeks, we will have another webinar, which uh, will be focused on the four pilot sites. So they'll be sharing a lot more information with you. So keep an eye out for that and we'll send you a message out when that webinar will take place. Uh, in the meantime, I'd just like to thank the panellists uh, for their contribution today and uh, close with a karakia. He aroha whakato, he aroha putamai. If kindness is sown, then kindness you will receive. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Mm.